I'm faculty at UC Davis. My name is Sharon Ebran. So my group works on, uh, with a focus on uh, structure of RNA molecules, and we specialize in, um, the ana in an analysis of a special type of experiments that today are high throughput experiments using sequencing, and they make measurements on the structure of RNA molecules. So we do two things in this domain. One thing that we do is how to analyze those da data because the extraction of structural information from them is non-trivial. So how do we extract the best possible information from the uh, noisy data? And the second domain is, once we have done that, how can we use this data or this information in order to improve structural prediction? And by structural prediction, I mean uh, um, there is a, a collection of problems. It's not just one problem of, problem of structural prediction. I'll try to show you a few of them uh, here. So last week, when, last year, when I visited CGSI, I actually talked about the first part. I presented a method that looks at um, genome-wide or transcriptome-wide data sets and tries to uh, find places that are probably uh, representative of certain structures, say hairpin, and directly from the data, pull them out and, and test them. And now I'm going to talk about the second part. Suppose that we already know how to analyze the data. How do we predict structure? Okay, so I will, uh, in my talk, give quite a lot of background. Um, so it will be half research, half background. And because we're talking about structure and structure in the context of function, I'll start with uh, three uh, families, well-known families for which uh, consensus structures exist. And each one of these cases is a whole family of different regulatory elements. And it's also well established for them that these structures serve them in order to carry out their function. So the first group uh, is called our RNA thermos thermosensors, and these are common in bacteria, and they change their structure in response to changes in temperature. The most obvious change, of course, is to open up the structure when a uh, temperature goes higher, but structure can sometimes also, uh, af at least after opening, uh, the RNA structure can fold into a different structure, so you can end up with either something open or something different. Ribose switches, also uh, common regulatory elements in bacteria, uh, they are known to change their structure in, uh, in the presence of certain ligands, such as metabolized or ions and so on. And when they do so, they uh, trigger uh, downstream changes that uh, impact gene expression, and we'll see more of them later. The third group is actually relevant to human genetics. These are G quadruplexes. These are very special and super stable structures that are made of stacks of G quartets. And they have been implicated in uh, neurological diseases and in cancer. So they're also uh, widely studied. Now, what's also common to all these three families is that they demonstrate very well that structure, RNA structure is also dynamic, meaning that you don't just freeze a structure in a certain conformation. These things change all the time, and when cellular environment changes, they change too. So in this case, it's temperature. In this case, it's certain ligands. And in this case, for example, it's potassium ions. Okay? And we're going to talk a lot about dynamic RNA structure. So just like some basic definitions, so that you'll know what I'm talking about. So we start with sequence. That's the primary structure. Then, in the context of secondary structure, what we call a secondary structure, we consider only three uh, possible base pairing. So we have the classical ones and the wobble pair. And then what you get is a certain base pairing pattern. Some bases pair with others, and some just stay alone. Okay? Now, on top of secondary structure, we also have tertiary structure, which is also important for function. So if we take, for example, this sequence, the first thing we can do is fold it into a secondary structure, but then on top of it, additional bonds can form, and this is tertiary structure. These are already not of the classical type. Okay? And typically, they're also um, weaker than uh, the secondary one. I will mostly talk about secondary for the reason that it's a, an easier problem than the other. Uh, but once in a while, I'll also refer to tertiary interaction. So now, when you study a new RNA and you want to know its function, most often, you will go to one of the popular software packages, like RNA structure via an RNA, and you will take the sequence, you plug it into an algorithm that is based on dynamic programming, and most users will uh, choose one 
with the most popular output, which is one structure. This is called the minimum free energy structure. So what the algorithm basically does, it goes over the entire space of possible uh, pairing patterns, and it gives an energy, a free energy score stability to each structure, and it gives you the best one, meaning the most stable one, or the one with the least free energy. Okay? And um, these algorithms at the time were a huge breakthrough, but now we know that their accuracy is not so great, and as RNAs get longer, accuracy drops pretty fast. And today, most importantly, is the, they don't seem very suitable for predicting structure in vivo. As I'll show later, predicting structures in vivo has become very relevant, and it wasn't until a few years ago. Why aren't they not so good? Because they are based on a thermodynamic model. It's called the nearest neighbor thermodynamic model. And this model was uh, made out of many, many, many uh, measurements made in vitro in the lab, outside of the cell environment. And people don't believe that these measurements are really applicable to what's happening in the cell, in terms of the environment itself, in terms of protein interactions, RNA-RNA inter interactions, and so on. So once we become interested in in vivo structures, this uh, framework becomes less and less relevant. An additional problem with it is that, that it doesn't scale to transcriptome studies. Like, if you want to uh, fold the whole transcriptome, it should take you between three to six weeks, depending on, on the transcriptome. So today, probably not the best solution. Now, for many years, people were pretty happy with this perspective that RNA has a structure, and it's probably DMFE structure. But today, as we learn about more and more RNAs, uh, we know that it's a very um, limited view of RNAs. Now, for many years, it seemed to be the right thing to do because many of the R functional RNAs that were studied really fit into this framework. So uh, RNAs like ribosomal RNA do need to maintain a very, very compact, stable shape in order to do their function. They can't afford to go over all, the, all over the place. Okay? So that seemed like a pretty good fit. However, today we have things like ribo switches that I showed before, and many, many other elements relevant to splicing, RNA protein interactions, and we know that they tend to alternate between several conformations. So for example, many of them in equilibrium will uh, alternate between two or three main dominant conformations. Each one of them is functional. And each one of them can be functional in different cellular contexts. Okay? So we want to model this kind of landscape. And the third type of landscape is the landscape where the RNA really is all over the place and switches between many, many, many different conformations. So people tend to think that coding regions of RNA are the type of RNAs that have this landscape, but we don't know for sure. And we also don't know if this is because you don't really need to be in a certain conformation or if this serves the functionality. So not, not much is known about that. And currently, many people are trying to um, tackle the problem of uh, characterizing the, the, the landscape that has several few uh, functional structures. Now, conceptually, the way we look at them are those um, pink curves. Basically, the height is the free energy. The, more, the lower it is, the better. It means the structure is more stable. The more stable the structure is, the more frequently you're going to see it. So this is directly related. More stable structures appear more of the time. Okay? Um, so the simple MFE structure, you will have one minimum, and you will find most of your uh, structures, you take a snapshot of uh, molecules in a solution, most of them will be stuck here, and it's hard to go out because you need energy in order to go out and get adopt another conformation. But in cases like that, for example, you will have multiple local minima, and they don't have to be at the same uh, height. So for example, this structure is more stable than that one, but still in equilibrium, you expect to see both. And you expect to see more, you expect to see a, sub, a bigger subpopulation of the more stable one than the less stable one, but you will see both. Um, okay, now when people want to characterize these landscapes, it's really difficult. It's really difficult because predicting one structure alone is not easy. And then when you start going into multiple structures, you start running into too many solutions and too many signals. So that's a, a difficult problem, both computationally and experimentally. Most of the studies today 
about such uh, ensembles, this is, this is called an ensemble, um, are made by NMR. Sometimes other techniques, very labor intensive, so, and very limited to very short molecules. In vitro, it's not something that you can do uh, a lot. So let me just give you an example. So this is an ensemble that was taken experimentally recently by NMR. So what you see here, like the illustration of the structural landscape, is not theory. This was measured. And you can see six conformations. Um, and this is uh, of the HIV tar hairpin. It's a very simple hairpin that has a very uh, important uh, job for HIV replication and uh, transcription. So it's very well studied. So what you can see here, those are six conformations with different stabilities. And below you can also see uh, their subpopulation percentages. So clearly those who are the most stable occupy together 80% of the ensemble and so on. And also, if these three conformations look the same to you, it's because they have the same, can you see that? Yeah. They have the same secondary structure, but they don't have the same tertiary structure. So the tertiary structure you can notice only in the small details. And the reason all of them are here separately is because each one has a different function. So here the tertiary structure is the one who modulates the function and therefore they are distinctly uh, observed. Even this one that seems like very unstable appears in a very low population fraction and it's still mentioned here. The reason is that in some circumstances, in some contexts, it will become very important. So show you in a minute. Okay, so you can see the, how the subpopulation uh, relative abundance correlates with the stability. Now what happens when something perturbs the system? For example, there are some proteins that are known to interact with this element. So for example, in this case, you can see what happens is that the distribution of structure changes, not the composition. It's the same structures being just weighed differently. So in this case, this structure that seemed to be very unfavorable becomes actually the best one. It becomes very stable, while the others, they don't change relative to each other, but relatively to this one, they are unstable. So it occupies most of the um, um, landscape. So that's in response to protein interaction. Similar things can happen when certain ions are in the system. Uh, in that case, for example, this structure gets stabilized. Um, and also mutations, which I'll show you later, they also change the stability and the balance between the structure. So collectively, we call this um, the Boltzmann ensemble or Boltzmann distribution of structures, which is something we would like to characterize. Um, now, just to show you that this is not only relevant to ribose switches, which many people will tell you about, this is actually relevant today to many things. So for example, in the last year, there were several uh, papers that uh, probed uh, pairing interactions in viruses, Zika virus, dengue, HIV, they're all RNA viruses, and they all found extensive alternative conformations. So they all found that in the, those RNA genomes, many nucleotides have many pairing mates, which means at the same time they go with that, they go with that. And this is something that we can, with the current prediction paradigm, we can't really figure out computationally, and experimentally it's, it's too costly. So what you can see here is just example for Zika virus, and this is an example of how many of the nucleotides had one partner, two partners, three partners, four partners, right? So we consider about 40% 40, 40 for um, dengue and a little bit less for Zika has at least one more partner than a single one. So that means it's very uh, prevalent and it also is seen a lot in the context of splicing, alternative splicing, that can be also biased by changing in the abundances and RNA protein interaction. Okay. So because of this, uh, people extended the dynamic programming paradigm, took the same model and say, okay, we can statistically sam sample these structures. So we call it statistical sampling of the Boltzmann ensemble. So basically you say, I want 1000 structures and the algorithm samples them for you and you get them. But then there are several problems with them, with that. First of all, um, when you start looking at the 1000 structures, some of them are very similar, but not quite. Some of them are very different. And I can tell you that after browsing 10 of them, and you typically take either 1,000 or 10,000 for reproducibility, then you lose track. You don't remember what you've seen. So it's very hard to visualize them. And it's also hard to cluster them in a, in a way that will be robust to the statistical variation in the samples. So 
you would typically want a concise description of a Boltzmann ensemble. The second problem is that they suffer from all the limitations of the thermodynamic model. They don't apply in vivo, um, and they can't accommodate complicated structures or tertiary structures and so on. Uh, on the other hand, they, they have shown to be better in terms of structure prediction because they do provide richer information on the structure landscape. OK, so now let me just show you an example. This is, um, there are two uh, structural populations here uh, for a given RNA, functional RNA. The gray population is a population where somebody asked for the minimum free energy structure and the, ten, the, the 1,000 structures above it in terms of free energy. So, so the uh, lowest 1,000 uh, structures. So they are concentrated here in terms of the free energy. The other 1,000 structures are the black ones they are achieved from sampling. So you basically sample from the model. And then you can see that you can get many more structures with much higher um, free energy that still seem to be prevalent there, right? So looking at the bottom of the free energy range is probably not showing you the whole story. So that gives you a, a better perspective. On the other hand, you can also see another thing here. This is the free energy of the MFE structure. And there is also a reference structure uh, obtained from comparative genomics for this one, and that's the free energy. So it shows that this uh, energy model is off. No matter if you sample the ensemble or you take the MFE, the energy model seems not to be so good. Okay, so now the next thing that came up in, in the structure uh, prediction world was um, structure probing experiment, which is the type of experiments that we analyze. Uh, they were developed a long time ago, but until a few years ago, they were not used much. They were hard to do, and they were also very low throughput. But with the advent of sequencing, they were scaled up to transcriptome-wide experiments and also now in vivo. So what do they give us? They basically give you a snapshot of all the structures in a sample in a given moment. They give you structural information at nucleotide re resolution, not at the motif resolution, which makes it a bit difficult to infer motifs on them. And what they know how to do is how to they can discriminate in some ways between paired and unpaired <coughs> nucleotide. Now, how do they do that? They use many different reagents, there are many, many techniques, and those reagents can uh, differentially interact with paired nucleotide versus unpaired. So for example, a reagent will interact mostly with unpaired nucleotide and one, not much with paired ones, so you will see a differential signal. So I will show you an example of such a um, a reagent. Now, the main downside of them is that they are blind to pairing interactions. They can only tell you with some accuracy if a, if a nucleotide is paired or unpaired, but they're not going to tell you who it's paired with, which is a very important thing in the context of structure. So generally what this uh, experiment will do, you will have an RNA, they will react preferentially with the unpaired nucleotide, uh, create some, modify those nucleotides in a certain way, and then you will assay the extent of modification in each nucleotide and you will get what's called reactivity, reactivity to the reagent. High reactivity per each nucleotide. High reactivity means probably unpaired. Low reactivity means probably paired, okay? Um, and as I said, even if you know paired, unpaired, you can have many situations where you have a sequence of say paired, paired, unpaired, unpaired, and so on, and all of these motifs that you see highlighted here, they all apply. So it's very hard to figure out the right structure from that. So now let me just show you um, how a typical experiment like that uh, works. I'll, I'll take SHAPE because it's, uh, it's the most uh, popular probe right now. SHAPE is just an acronym. It's selective two prime hydroxyl isolation analyzed by primary expansion. Basically, you take your RNA, fold it in the in vitro, and then you uh, mix it with the reagent and reaction occurs and preferentially it will occur in unpaired nucleotides. So you'll see many copies um, modified in different ways. So modification is just shown here like an adduct because this probe actually uh, creates an adduct. Now you need to know where modifications happen. So you anneal a primer and then you reverse transcribe because the uh, nucleotides is modified, the reverse tr uh, transcription cannot uh, continue and then you end up with uh, pieces of uh, cDNA that are complementary to a subsequence of the RNA, and they terminate at the end of modification. So then, for example, if you have a sequencer, 
you just take these cDNAs, you sequence them, you map back, then you know how many fragments report uh, interaction at this point and that point and that point, okay? So that shows you the degree of interaction at each position. And from that, you can uh, infer how likely it is to be paired or unpaired. Now, today we also have the high throughput version with sequencing. So basically, it's very similar to RNA-seq. You randomly prime the entire transcriptome. And again, you, um, you have the modification everywhere. And you reverse transcribe. And you take those uh, cDNAs, you map them back. And then you basically count modifications. And then you translate them into these nucleotide reactivities that I show you. You also have a control experiment because often you will see uh, terminations even if no modification occurs. There is noise in the process, it's very noisy. So you measure that and then you subtract. Now, very more recently, we had a new version that was facilitated by next generation sequencing where you don't really terminate at the location of modification, but rather you continue transcribing, but you introduce a mutation at that location very similar to bisulfide sequencing. Now, essentially it looks the same, the reactivities look the same, so it doesn't matter, matter much, but there is an important point here that the reads that come out of that type of uh, um, approach, they can assay multiple modifications per read. The previous approach can only tell you about one read at a time, the first one that it encountered. Now you may think it doesn't matter, or maybe it saves you a little bit of money, but as we'll see later, it may be very relevant if you're trying to characterize folding ensembles. So just to um, recap this uh, part on structure probing, because of this uh, scaling uh, of these experiments, many uh, new things were uh, enabled because of them. So this is just a, an overview of some of them. So you can see that today we can really do them in any cell, in any different conditions. We can get measurements from conditions where the uh, free energy model just does not apply. So that's very informative. You can probe one RNA of interest or the entire transcriptome in vivo, in vitro. People also use them now to study tertiary structure, which is a much more complicated thing. And people use them for the following two things that I'll show you. One is exactly characterizing those subpopulation in equilibrium, which is what we're interested in, the folding ensemble. And the other one is to uh, characterize co-transcriptional folding. What is co-transcriptional folding? Basically, when RNA uh, gets made, uh, the RNA strand gets longer and longer. And as it gets longer, it starts folding. That's a dynamic process. Then it extends longer and longer. Then it sometimes refolds because there are new nucleotides and they man manage to grab the paired nucleotides and change the equilibrium and everything. So this is a dynamic process that we typically, we don't see it, we just look at the end result. And we don't really know what happened in between. So we'll take a look at that. Today we can actually follow that too, experimentally. So just to end this, I'll just give you a sense of how these data look like. So you'll see that it's informative, but, but far from being perfect. Therefore, we typically combine free energy thermodynamics with, with this kind of experiment. So let's just look at this RNA. And this is the known secondary structure for it. And now I'll show you the um, shape profile. And it's color coded such that high values are red, um, red orange, and low values uh, are black or, or green. OK, so the free strand here that you see here is highly reactive, as you would expect, right? And then you have a hairpin, okay, a pretty big one. So what you would expect is a valley Valley peak valley, right? Because it should be low, high, low, which is what you get. So this is the paired stem, the loop paired. Okay, that looks good with some exceptions. Although this is a bulge, right? So this is unpaired. Then you have another free strand. So it's reactive, but not as this one, right? Very different, although it's also unpaired. So it's not deterministic. It's a very stochastic process. Another hairpin, like a valley peak valley, and another. Okay, so that's basically from this kind of data, you have to figure out things like that. Um, and clearly when the reactivities are super high, super low, it's pretty easy, but unfortunately mono, most of them are somewhere in the middle where uh, statistical inference is needed. Uh, okay, so now with this data, people also updated the uh, thermodynamic paradigm. They took the same dynamic programming algorithms and found uh, different ways to uh, 
uh, merge them with the data to improve uh, uh, accuracy, but pretty much that's, that's most of the things that were done with this data. Uh, update ensemble sampling and update MFE sampling. And again, limitations are the same limitations of the NNTM uh, framework. So now what are we trying to do here? We're trying to do the following. We have some reactivity data. We want to use it in order to reconstruct an ensemble, okay? For a given RNA, a given condition. So we measured it, and now we want to identify the key functional structures, and very few of them, not 1,000. We want a very concise, simplified picture of very complex dynamics, and we not only want to know who the structures are, we also want to know the relative abundance, which is basically characterizing, on a high level, the folding ensemble. So the approach we take, we took, had a combined probabilistic modeling with linear modeling. Um, so the method called SLICS, Structure Landscape Experiment Quantifier, uh, does the following. It operates at the read level, and it takes two types of inputs. One type of input is just the sequencing data, right? And they can come in two flavors. One is just the mutation patterns, and one are the truncation patterns, which are different length of uh, um, fragments, okay? So it can work in both modes. And the other thing that it needs, it needs some kind of prior information. So the prior information comes in the form of a set of candidate structures. Now, where do you get this set? You can get it from wherever you want, and you can, it can be as big as you want, as small as you want. Uh, so most common way to get it is to do statistical sampling, right? That's what most people know. Um, but you can also do more sophisticated samplings that will give you tertiary interactions or pseudo-knotted structures, structures that don't, um, are not produced by the regular framework. And you can also spike in your own structures. So if you're a biologist working on these systems many years and you speculate maybe this and this is there, you can put it there too. It can be tertiary, it can be anything. So you're not constrained by what you can put in. Then you will do some statistical inference, which I'll describe. And the output will be the uh, two things that I just showed. Who are those dominant structures and what are the relative abundances? Uh, okay, so as I said, this is a merging of two models. So it has two modeling layers. The first is how does a structural signature look at the read level? So every structure that is in this ensemble will generate a read, right? And this read will have some modification pattern. So the question is, can I uh, quantify probabilistically, given a structure and given a, a read with a pattern, how likely is this read coming from that structure? Okay? So I need some uh, generative model to do that, to connect them uh, probabilistically. So I'll show you this model. Basically, then I can map every structure that I'm given to every pattern that I see in the data. Once I've done that, I have to go and collect the structural signatures from all structures, and that will be the shape readout. So the reactivity that I measure is really the sum or the average over all those structures. Shape doesn't tell you this came from here and that came from that, right? So I need to aggregate them and that I'll do just with a linear model and I'll impose sparsity when I fit it to the data. So that's basically it. So now the, the initial part, how do you map structures to, to reads or to modification patterns? So just a, a toy example here. We have the same sequence and suppose it, it can fall into these three different structures. So uh, what I do is I linearize it and I encode each structure, each structure as paired, unpaired for each nucleotide. Okay? So paired will be dark, unpaired will be white. Then I have a very, very simplified model that really is not realistic, but hopefully it's realistic enough. I say that if a nucleotide is paired in this structure, it can never be modified. That's not true. Okay? But there is also a noise cleaning process here, so hopefully it's not too far from reality. The other option is it's unpaired. Then, of course, there is a chance it will be modified. What's the chance? It depends on how much reagents were put in there and how many competitors are there. There is an ensemble, and there are many, many open, or many, many unpaired nucleotides in this ensemble, and all of them compete for this modifier. Okay? So it's just a general uh, competition, it's just a, a, a regular model very similar to models of RNA-seq uh, for isoform detection and things like that. So I have this uh, one parameter, which is what is the probability for an open, for an unpaired position to be modified, and I need to estimate it. Well, once I have it, I can 
uh, write an expression that if you give me a structure and a pattern, I will calculate the probability that this structure generated this pattern. It will be, of course, a, a, a function of a eta, this parameter. It will also be a function of those gammas, which are the noise parameters, which are estimated from the control experiment. So we can think of them at this point as a num numbers. Now, this is a relatively simple expression because it's for the um, mutational approach. The other one is slightly more complicated, but overall they are very simple. And these are extensions of, of prior work that I did for a simpler model. OK, so now let's see what this really means. So suppose my real ensemble had these two structures, these five copies. Okay, And I ended up with these modification patterns. So they generated these reads. Okay? Now I take these reads. You can see the same reads, the same patterns of mutations here. But now I'm uh, contemplating between four structures. I don't know who is there. right? But luckily, I have the, right, the two right one and also some other. So I can take all these structures and, again, linearize them. Here, what you see is just a dot bracket uh, representations, which uh, bracket is paired, dot is unpaired. So it's similar to the lines that I showed you before. And you can see, for example, that the magenta structure can explain very well these patterns, but certainly cannot explain these patterns because it's supposed to be paired here. So it can support some of the data very well. Similarly, the blue one definitely cannot support these patterns because that's paired here, but supports very well these reads. Okay? So each one of them supports part of the data. These two structures clearly don't belong here because they don't support this or that, right? because it all falls on paired uh, reasons. And of course, in reality, the data is not that simple, and the ensemble is not that simple. Okay, So now I take everything, I get to the linear uh, point. What do I do? I take all the structures. Now, every structure has some a chance of generating every pattern. But it also depends, the likelihood that I will see a pattern in my data depends also on how prevalent this structure is. If it's coming from a very dominant subpopulation, I will see more of it in the data. So how well we are represented in the data is a function of two things. How, uh, how prevalent is the structure that generates you? And how likely is this structure to generate you too? So if you're familiar with isoform level detection models, they're very, very similar to that. So what you do is basically you will multiply the probability that each structure generates each function by its unknown relative abundance, which is this vector. So this is what we want to estimate, the unknown rel uh, rel uh, relative abundances. So basically, it's just a linear model. You fit it. Initially, we fit it with non-negative uh, non linear square. And now we're doing it with Lasso, um, <coughs> but it's generally it's very standard uh, methodology. So basically, you have a matrix called the design matrix. Uh, all the rows correspond to all the possible patterns that you've seen in your data. All the columns co correspond to all the candidate structures that somebody gave you. Everything you want to consider, you can put in there. Um, OK, now, what the, th the important thing to note is that every pattern here basically imposes a linear constraint on the system. And in those systems, you always have a problem with multiple solutions. You want to drive them to a solution that very likely is not one of another 1,000 solutions, right? They have too many solutions. You're trying to um, narrow this, the search space, which we do by uh, regularization. Um, but also, if we have more patterns, we can impose more constraints on the system. That also helps converging to a smaller number of solutions. So having more patterns seems like a good thing. So now that, that brings me back to what is a data pattern. So I, let's uh, see again that we have two different uh, detection parameters. No matter how modification looks like, we can uh, detect them either by the truncation, like stop when you uh, encounter a modification, or mutate and continue. And as I said, there is a fundamental difference between them. The mutation approach can um, assay multiple modifications in the same read. The other one cannot. It can always tell you only about the first one, even if there were five after, after it. Okay? So that means that there is less data here, less information, right? because it doesn't tell you about everything. The question is, does it really matter? So let's look, for example, on the patterns that you get. And we have like a short sequence here. And we can uh, look at the uh, mutations, or we can look at the truncations of the same uh, ensemble and what happened there. Now, 
so what you can see here are examples of if modifications were here, then you will get all these patterns in the mutation approach, but all of them will be reduced to that single pattern in the truncation approach. In other words, the truncation approach has very few patterns, which means very few data points, which means very few constraints. So in that context, it carries much less information than the uh, mutational approach. The mutational approach preserves much more information on who can be together with who at what read. That is lost when you go to truncation. And therefore, you have very few data points. If you have an RNA of length n, you have n plus one data points. It's not much for a linear system. Here you have many more, which compl complexity-wise, it's, it's a mess. But on the other hand, might be helpful, in, especially when you look for sparse solutions. Another thing is that you can always convert this data set to that data set. Why? Because, for example, if you look at all these patterns, the first modification happened here. So clearly all of them, if you had the truncation approach, would just turn out to be that, right? But you cannot go backwards because you lost information. Now, why am I telling you all that? I'll show you. Um, okay, so, so the first uh, validation that we did for this uh, method um, was on a very, very simple data set that was uh, published at the time. It was an in vitro high quality data set where um, they took a, an element, a regulatory element called the ribose snitch. What's a ribose snitch? It's a, a, an element on an RNA transcript when a mutation, a single point mutation, ends up altering the structure of the transcript. Now, some of these are harmless and you don't know about it, but some of them have been associated with the diseases. So there are some kind of GWAS analysis that connect uh, SNPs in regulatory regions to uh, certain diseases. So this uh, uh, ribosnitch was already found in another um, uh, study that also used structure probing genome-wide to find many of them. So they already knew it's a ribosnitch. And then they took this sequence and they took the two alleles. There is an A allele and there is a C allele. So the allele the SNP location is here, okay? Um, and they probe them separately. So first, they probe them with their method in different solutions. Uh, the method is called DMS map seq, which means map means mutation profiling. DMS is kind of like shape, just uh, applicable only to A's and C's. So it means fewer data points that you have. So when you probe them separately, that's how the profile of the ALE looks like, and that's how the CL is looks like, so clearly they're not the same structure. This is very clear from the profile. And these are the data-directed predictions of both of these allele structure. Now, another thing you need to understand is that those empty circles mean sequences that were probed but not common to both of these um, alleles. So the sequences we're really looking at starts here, oops, starts here, right, and ends here in the same here. So it might be difficult to see, but m some of those nucleotides changed uh, status from paired to unpaired and vice versa. Now, the second thing they did, they mixed them together. They mixed both a little together and then they probed the heterogeneous sample and they got that. So clearly none of these three profiles looks the same. This is just a mixture of these two and these are clearly different structures. So now, the thing is, can we take this pretty simple experiment take the uh, uh, heterogeneous measurement and decouple it into those two components, okay? which is a, a, a relatively simple task for this system. Um, now, another attractive thing about this experiment is that it allowed us to recover the ground truth. Why? Because we mapped all the reads, and because you can see the, the SNP location, then you know if it came from this or little data list. So it showed us that 40% in the sample was from this one and then the other one. So we knew we could benchmark against the ground truth. So what you can see here, this is the ground truth. So it's, 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 it's almost actually 30, 70, not 40, 60. And you can see here a, a comparison. We first took the mutation data and plugged it into Slick and looked at what we did. We got, and we ran it 10 times. Why do we run it 10 times? Because each time we start with a sample, statistical sample of the ensemble of 1,000 structures. Every statistical sample is different than the other one. There is stochasticity in there. So one thing you want to know is that your algorithm is robust to those variations. 
especially because most of the clustering methods for ensembles are not. You change a little bit the ensemble, and then you throw off the, cl the clustering. So this is why there are 10 runs each time. So, and you can see here the average reconstruction, which is not that bad compared to the ground truth. And also you can see that the variance, the variation between stochastic samples is really, really small. But we also wanted to know, is mutation really better than tr truncation? Is it more informative? And one reason we were interested in that is that um, the makers of this uh, um, technique said that, yeah, this is a main advantage. You can really gouge ensemble uh, inf information for me. So we did, we converted the mutation data to truncation, which we can do, and ran it again. And to our surprise, at least to my surprise, the uh, truncation actually did better than the mutation, but not, not by a lot, not something meaningful. Now, we don't know why, because my logic still says that when you impose more, constra more constraints on the system, it should work better. We think it might be a, a result of the fact that there is a very, very small population of um, uh, multiple modica modification reads. So there are very few uh, reads here with two modifications and almost none with three. Why? Because we have limitations on how frequently we can modify the RNA, because if you modify it too often, you can change the structure, right? So it defeats the purpose. So today, about every 50 nucleotide, and when you look at such a small RNA, you just can't get too many double mutations. So you can't get much X-ray formation. So we think it may be that. I'm not sure. This is something we're still looking into. Um, OK. Now, let me skip to the next uh, thing. I will skip that. The next thing, after we validated it, was to look at a more complex and interesting uh, system, which is the folding pathway of a bistable ribose switch. So I talked about core transcriptional uh, probing or a constitutional structure before, and that's exactly what we uh, did. Um, there was a new system, I'll show you in a minute, that was developed and probed uh, what's called the fluoride riboswitch. This riboswitch, once uh, the RNA is trans uh, transcribed a little bit, adopts a certain structure, which it looks like that at the nucleotide level, and then at a certain point in this process, there is a bifurcation. If fluoride ions are there, this structure is maintained very well and stable. And then transcription continues, there is more RNA, the rest of the RNA falls on its own, everything is good, transcription goes as usual, and everything works. But at the same time point, if fluoride ions are not there, this structure can't keep tight anymore without the fluoride. And then it breaks apart. And it breaks apart, and then what happens is that the uh, additional RNA strand that was transcribed goes in and changes the structure and everything refolds. And it refolds into something that is called the terminator helix, which is a helix that doesn't let you continue with transcribing. So basically it turns gene expression off, like it, the polymer just flies out and that's it. So that's a, rib that's a, a ribo switch. It's a switch that can go either this way or that way depending on the presence of a, a certain ligand. So, without getting into too much detail, a, a new system was developed to probe exactly co-transcriptional uh, pathways because this thing happens somewhere in the process and not when you look at the end product. Um, so there is a way to probe it and basically to um, take snapshots of all the intermediate folds on the way until you get the full uh, ribose switch. And then you probe all of them from structure and then you look at their shape profiles. So the way to read the data, the data looks like those uh, matrices. Every row here is a shape profile of an intermediate transcript. So as we go down, the transcripts get longer and longer and longer and refold. Okay? Same here. One of them is with fluoride, one is without fluoride. The colors are just showing you know, high-low reactivities. So now, how do you model the pathway from, from that information? Basically, they took, um, they did differential analysis, they subtracted uh, one matrix from the other, and then they looked at changes. They looked at column by column, which means nucleotide by nucleotide, and tried to see if they see trends by eye, very qualitative analysis. And by tracking ab about six nucleotides, they suggested a, a bifurcation mechanism and why it happens. Okay? So now we said, can we reproduce this uh, pathway, but quantitatively? Um, so we took all their data, and the data included a lot of other stuff. We analyzed everything, 
before I'll show you the result, let me just uh, introduce you to the main players here, which are uh, four structures. So these two structures, they fold when the RNA gets longer. Okay? Uh, so you get that, and you get that, and that's before bifurcation. It doesn't matter if fluoride is there, it looks the same. Here what you can see is the formation of a pseudonaut, so all this thing falls on itself, but all that is before bifurcation. At this point exactly, this is where bifurcation happens, something happens, right, what we just showed, and at the end, you get these two final outcomes, either no transcription or transcription with different, very different uh, structures. So now I'll just show you the relative abundance trajectories that we reconstructed for this system. Um, and you can see above when there is no fluoride and below is where there is fluoride. Now we tracked uh, three populations. One of them is basically, the, the blue one is the one that allows transcription, is the one with the pseudonaut, okay? So you, that's blue. Red is the one that shuts down with the terminator. And uh, light blue is just everything else, okay? And then you can see three subphases here from the way, from bifurcation point to the end. You can see that you start with other structures. So you start with a very diverse ensemble of nothing special, okay? And almost nothing from the other two forms. And at this point, when uh, terminators start forming, suddenly the uh, off structure shoots up and the other one, the others go down. So this becomes a very homogeneous ensemble, only one thing. And then it stabilizes. So there, it ends now in one state. There is one population that dominates the whole thing, and that's the off, meaning no transcription. Here, it's the same, but much more uh, subtle. You start with other and some of the blue, then red also goes up, and blue kind of stays the same, but the others go down. So you lose the diversity, but you converge into a bistable system. You have two states. You have red and you have blue in a 60-40 uh, percent population, so they coexist together. So with fluoride and without fluoride, you get different uh, ensembles um, and so on. Now the last thing I'll show is um, you can also capture the diversity by entropy calculations. So because we had a quantitative evaluation of all the pairing interaction and all that, we could calculate base pairing entropies and you can see also that in both systems, so one system is the two states, like blue and red are now, uh, blue and red are now just with without uh, ligand. You can see high entropy because it was very diverse. Then entropy starts going down. And at the end, it goes down much more for the single st state because it's less diverse. Everybody looks the same, so it's low entropy. Versus the other one, is lower than the beginning, but still higher because it has two states. So some more diversity, which is captured well by entropy. So I, I can end here if I'm out of time. And let me just acknowledge the student who did all this work and a lot more that I didn't present. Um, so this is Huali, that's her work. Um, she really did a lot of more things with this algorithm that I didn't sh show and was funded by NIH and I'm happy to take any questions.